good afternoon. So earlier when there were only two people in the room, I was like, wow, I've, and I've done this before. I've traveled all over New York State to talk about um, educating uh, uh, both um, providers and, and patients about heart failure, and I've been in places where we spoke to two people, or one person. So, um, so I'd like to talk a little about heart failure and this epidemic. I think that it's uh, you know maybe a topic a little bit different from the majority of the topics presented, but I think it it, it may present some challenges for uh, educational systems in, in other parts of the world. I definitely think that here in the United States we're we're grappling with it a little bit. Um, I'm from Strong Memorial Hospital. We're a, a, a large tertiary quaternary care hospital, the the 21st uh, largest academic medical center. United States. Um, every time you give a medical talk, you have to have the helicopter shot from the air, and this is our campus. And our hospital and the beds that I manage patients at, we look out at Mount Hope Cemetery, which is a very large, beautiful Victorian cemetery. But many of my patients ask me, why, why do we look out at a cemetery? <laughs> and uh, I don't have an answer for that. Although many hospitals developed near cemeteries because uh, at one point hospitals were mainly to help ease suffering and, and transition people. Nowadays, hopefully, we, we don't um, send too many people in that direction. So just, uh, just you know, we heard a little bit about Rochester from some of the speakers, but uh, this area, and I've lived here for now 11 years, uh, we have some great things. One is we have enough water. We have 84% of North America's fresh water. We have 21% of the world's supply of fresh water in the, in the Great Lakes. So with global warming, I feel we're, we're very well situated. And we have um, one of the few large rivers that flow from south to north, uh, opposite of traditional rivers which flow towards the equator. Uh, we have the largest dam east of the Mississippi in the United States, uh, the Mount Morris Dam. Uh, the game of baseball, which is basically America's favorite pastime, the longest baseball game in history was played in Rochester and in uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. It took two days, and two fairly famous American baseball players, Wade Both and Calvert Pin Jr., played in that game. We have the second largest children's museum in the United States. We are the second or third largest wine producing state. So if you like wine, you can visit the, the Finger Lake Wines, wineries. And we have the largest wine company in the world, Constellation Brands, headquartered in New York. Um, and we are home to various firsts abolitionists, bloomers, fishing reel, marshmallow, jello, French's mustard, baby shoes, gold teeth, and the male chute. And we've had eight Nobel Prize winners and 12 Pulitzer Prize winners at the uh, University of Rochester. Okay, so why is heart failure important? Well, at least in cardiology, heart failure, where the heart doesn't work, doesn't pump well enough, this is the only, uh, unfortunately, the only field in heart disease that's growing. We're getting better at taking care of heart attacks and high blood pressure and cholesterol and those things, but heart failure is still growing. And really, it's, it's an epidemic for a lot of different reasons. And it's posing some issues with structures for hospitals and for educational systems in terms of getting the type of trained personnel to deal with it. Um, I think the, the rest of the world, particularly in the developing countries, um, uh, heart failure may not be as much of a problem because the, the diseases of, I think, um, uh, a Western uh, culture, uh, unfortunately, is catching up in the rest of the world, but, but we're at the forefront in the United States. So I have these slides. These are from the um, Center for Disease Control, looking at obesity in the United States. Um, we call obesity uh, using a body mass index calculation. So you're, you're overweight if your body mass index is from 25 to 30. If your body mass index is over 30, you're considered obese. So this is considered obese. And they started tracking in about 1985, um, the, the rates of obesity. And looking at the, the data there, uh, the white states had not reported data. The light blue, less than 10% of the population uh, obese. And then the darker blue, 10 to 14%. And I'm just going to flip through the years here fairly quickly and just kind of watch the United States progress from 1985 to about 2007. So 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97. In 97, they had to add another category, uh, those states with more than 20% of the population obese. 98, 99, 2000, 
2001, they had to add another category. Uh, um, Mississippi, they had to add over 25% of the population is obese. 24, 2004, 2005, 2005, they added another category. Over 30% of the population of that state um, obese. And then to 2009. So Colorado is currently the only state in the United States that has um, less than 15% of the population obese, whereas uh, there's quite a centering in the, in the southern states, including my home state of Missouri, of obesity. And this just shows you the progression from 1990 to 1999 to 2009. And this also mirrors um, other diseases such as diabetes. Uh, we progress with diabetes, hypertension, uh, and then heart attacks and heart disease. So variability across the United States, um, but very much linked to, I think, uh, the prevalence of obesity. And there's a lot of reasons. Um, we've become a less active uh, culture, uh, fast foods, um, uh, although cigarette smoking has declined quite a bit. You know, a lot of things have come together. We have a population that's aging. The number of people over the age of 65 in the United States has grown considerably. Our baby boomers are, are reaching uh, kind of the, the years with more medical issues. The number of people over the age of 100 in the United States has grown. Um, uh, in the last census, it's up to over 100,000 uh, individuals. So basically, perfect storm for heart failure. The United States um, in 2006 are about 5.8 million people with heart failure. So as a disease uh, in the medical community, it's an area that's targeted very heavily because it, there's a high prevalence and a lot of deaths, um, almost 300,000 uh, fatalities a year in the United States. And every year we add another 550,000 new patients with heart failure. And by the age of 65, about 10 out of every 1,000 uh, individuals in the United States have heart failure. So by 2030, that's about 10 million uh, US citizens. And it costs us $39 billion in terms of healthcare costs, hospitalizations, uh, lost revenue from, from work and, and um, disability. And it's equal opportunity um, it, as, uh, as women uh, become older, they catch up with men and actually pass men in terms of the heart failure prevalence. And the same with heart failure hospitalizations, actually uh, more women than men are hospitalized. This is a little bit older slide, but just breaking down the breakdown, the majority of the costs are in uh, hospitalizations and, and nursing home care. This is a slide from 2005, and the costs were estimated $25 billion. So, one of the questions is, is what do we do in the United States and um, how do we uh, try to deal with this booming population of heart failure patients? Well, we definitely have the, the, the high end, and this is what um, we are in Rochester, having the ability to, to take care of the, the sickest heart failure patients. And we have a, a heart failure, advanced heart failure program since 2001. Um, in the Rochester area, we serve about four and a half million people. We're the only transplant center. Uh, the Green Stars, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, uh, Philadelphia, um, New York City, and then Albany, which did have a program, is now closed. Those are transplant programs, the programs that do heart transplantation. Um, we have an international border and a lake that uh, uh, separates us, but for the most part, we serve a pretty large geographic area. And in starting our program, we, uh, I mentioned yesterday, there was a lot of partnerships that we had to develop to, to serve this large geographic area. Um, we have uh, hospitals throughout that send us patients, that we go to pick up patients who refer patients to us. We work with the, the physicians there, the, the care providers in those areas. And we have um, ways to transport patients by ambulance, uh, critical care transports using uh, special teams of providers, nurses, and, and other special providers to pick up patients from all over the state. Uh, we can also fly by helicopter and um, we travel in the snow. And we travel by uh, fixed wing as well to, to more distant places or when we need to travel faster. <coughs> And when need be, a physician also travels on the, on the trip, so I've gone on a lot of these um, 
uh, flights and, and ground transportation. And since we started our program, uh, the, the number of patients referred to us on a monthly basis has continued to grow. And right now, we average about 30 uh, new patients a month. And these are not just 30 patients with heart failure. These are 30 patients that are really ill enough that they're considering uh, really advanced care like heart transplantation. Unfortunately, heart transplant is not a great therapy. You know, I talked about the half a million new patients a year. Uh, there's probably a quarter million people in the United States every year who, who are ill enough to be eligible for a heart transplant. But last year, in 2010, there were only 2,333 heart transplants. And worldwide, there's approximately 4,000 transplants done a year. So it's a very limited therapy, uh, a kind of a, a epidemiologic drop in the bucket in terms of what we can do to help people. Um, the the um, green bar are the number of patients we put on the waiting list. The yellow is the transplants or orange. And then the red is the number of people who die on the waiting list. Luckily, even though we're not doing any more transplants, fewer people are dying waiting on the list because we have other therapies such as um, heart pumps. We did our first heart transplant in Rochester in uh, February 2001 and have uh, performed approximately 142, 143 transplants. Uh, again, uh, it's a small part of what we do because it is the, the, the last option for, for patients. Um, we do heart pumps and um, uh, in addition to transplant heart pumps, these mechanical pumps are things that we don't have to find donors for. Um, they're electrically driven pumps that pump the blood. Uh, I think if you uh, follow the news, you know that uh, former Vice President Cheney uh, here in the United States has a heart pump uh, called a, a HeartMate 2. And um, that's put it kind of in the forefront that he received this last year. We use a lot of different pumps. It depends on the, the situation. The pump on the bottom right, though, is the, the pump that we currently use the most. It's a little pump that's implanted inside the abdomen, connected and, and pumps the blood. Um, there are patients that now have been on this pump for seven years and, and counting, so quite a long time. But it's an expensive therapy, and it's a specialized therapy that requires fairly specialized uh, training and team members to, to care for patients with these pumps. But it's a growing part of the future of advanced heart failure care. We were uh, able to implant this particular pump for the first time in, in 2004, and um, currently we have approximately 80 uh, individuals on this pump all over upstate New York, northern Pennsylvania, um, and, and in, in the Buffalo area, I think we have uh, 16 uh, individuals on the pump. Especially if you go out to a movie theater, you might sit next to somebody with a pump and perhaps not even know it. And this is um, actually a professor of music. Uh, he plays a trumpet. Um, it's performed in the Rochester Jazz Festival. And you can see on his belt, he's wearing a electronic um, controller. And in holsters, he has two battery packs. And he is connected to a, a heart pump. Um, before he got the heart pump, he didn't have enough breath to, to play the trumpet. Um, but now he can, and he's traveling around the country uh, playing at jazz festivals. So, you know, to at least try to tie this into um, uh, the topics in this, in this conference, I think one area is, is just, you know, who takes care of these patients and, and how you get to that point uh, what is the workforce like? Well, for, for medical care, uh, obviously we have um, medical schools. And currently in the United States, there are 131 medical schools uh, compared to 200 law schools. I think um, that's a little bit unfair, but uh, the, uh, there's been somewhat of a shortage of physicians in the United States. And in, 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 in some ways, there's been um, quite a bit of shortage, depending on what part of the country you're in. Rural areas, underserved areas, have quite a physician shortage. Some of the uh, cities have perhaps an overabundance of physicians, so we have a workforce uh, maldistribution. Um, the, the, the only reason that the, the medical care in the United States has been able to proceed is that we have a lot of foreign medical graduates that come to the United States and practice uh, from all over the world. 
uh, from 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 Asia, from Ireland, from Germany. Um, they uh, thankfully uh, they do go to a lot of the areas that do not um, have enough physicians. Uh, the, the, the government recognizes that the shortage, and they've encouraged um, medical schools to increase their capacities, and also to increase the new medical schools. There's um, 12 to 18 new medical schools. There's a lot of medical schools being discussed, uh, 12 that have actually committed to uh, forming in the next four to five years. Um, this is currently for a workforce of about 660,000 physicians in the United States serving the 330 million people in the United States. Uh, cardiologists, there's only 26,000 cardiologists. But if you talk about specialized heart failure cardiologists dealing with that big epidemic of heart failure patients, there's probably less than a thousand people that um, truly, uh, you know, have the extra training. And if you talk about the the very most high level training, knowing the heart pumps, knowing all the, the different areas, then it's, it's really hard to know. There are only about um, 70 centers in the United States that implant the heart pump and about 120 centers that do heart transplant. So one area that um, uh, has been thought of to increase the pool of providers that are specialized in this field is to, to go somewhat through the regulatory method of having an advanced certification. So the, the first heart failure boards, this is in addition to the other uh, medical training, cardiology training is, it was offered last year. And now to have um, additional training after your uh, traditional cardiologist training. And starting next year, there'll be fellowships that will be accredited by the uh, accreditation uh, group, the uh, ACGME, American College of Graduate Medical Education. So to become a heart failure cardiologist, it's the four years of undergraduate school, four years of medical school, three years of residency, three years of cardiology fellowship, and then another year of advanced heart failure fellowship. It's a lot of time and it's a lot of uh, student debt, um, a lot of discussions uh, in the last couple of days about the cost of education and uh, why, for example, a community college um, has uh, many benefits because of the lower costs and more focused, directed, uh, perhaps some vocational training. Well, the same thing applies to this algorithm in medical school, to go through that many years um, with uh, basically a, a mortgage or two, and then to start practice, uh, it, it dissuades some people from doing the, the, the long, intense training um, areas. So our governing boards are talking about ways to shorten the period of time. I think there's always some risk if you shorten the time too much, will the training be adequate? But um, they're looking at ways to cut off some of the time. Now we do a lot of things because we know that the providing of the care is is one thing, but you know the best thing would be to disseminate care to be done by everybody, Pri primary care physicians, general practitioners, uh, other cardiologists. So we do a lot of uh, education throughout our region. Um, better yet, if we could prevent heart disease from happening, uh, the obesity epidemic. Well, there are ways to get around that. You know, add sidewalks. Um, change uh, uh, the, the suburban, um, urban differentiation, uh, make uh, commuting uh, by cars less desirable, different things to change that. And I think that there's a lot of things afoot now. For example, uh, the state of California took chocolate milk out of their cafeterias. So the, uh, the sugar content of the, the children's diet will, will fall by you know, something like 500 calories a lunch, um, taking out the, the bad foods and the, and the vending machines, a lot of things that can be done. And there's a lot of research looking at this because the cost of the care that we deliver with mechanical heart pumps and transplants is far too expensive to be sustainable in, um, in this country, let alone in the rest of the world. So I think there have been ways to address this with um, curriculum development in the medical school to um, target prevention more so than treating the disease after it happens. So we much rather prevent the disease from ever happening. Um, in our training programs at various levels, uh, awareness of heart failure in the epidemic, um, training other uh, physicians to, to be aware of, the, of this group of patients. Um, the hospitals care very much because in the United States, there are measures where 
care of patients with heart failure are linked to uh, payment, to money. So when the hospital knows that they will not uh, get paid if the heart failure management is not up to a standard that the government sets, then there's a lot of initiative to improve that. So we have a lot of issues in our hospitals on safety, quality, and patient satisfaction, three areas that um, the government is uh, focusing on. For example, for the University of Rochester, starting in July, our management of heart failure patients will be linked to reimbursements by Medicare, the largest payer uh, for, uh, for health care in the United States. And if we don't meet certain targets, we, we stand to lose up to 2% of our annual Medicare uh, funding, which at it, strong would be approximately $9.2 million. Um, so a, a very large uh, stick um, to uh, improve care, and we're definitely working on that. Another area that's been worked on is uh, augmenting our, our workforce with um, uh, what called physician extenders, um, uh, mid-level providers. These are nurse practitioners and physician assistants primarily. These are uh, well-trained um, uh, care providers uh, that um, can augment the workforce considerably uh, at less cost uh, to the healthcare system. And of course, disease prevention. You know, heart failure is typically uh, in the United States, the main cause of heart failure is heart attacks, which is linked considerably to uh, smoking, obesity, hypertension, cholesterol. A lot of the diseases that um, are modifiable, and yes, there are genetics, there are congenital heart disease, there are viruses, there are diseases that, uh, as individuals, we don't have control over, but I think the ones that we do have some control over, we have to work very hard to reduce. And a lot of research is going on to uh, prevent this health care or this heart failure epidemic from really bursting our uh, health care crisis in terms of the amount of money that we spend on health care. So that is my quick medical presentation. Um, uh, Meliora is uh, it's the University of Rochester saying for, for, I think it's onward, ever onward, ever higher. Uh, so, any questions from anybody? Happy to uh, answer them. The uh, the recommendation for steps a day is is ten thousand steps. For the average person, depending on your stride, that would be about five miles of walking. So it's anywhere from two thousand to twenty two hundred steps a day is a mile for the average person. So yes, um, if you have a desk job, you're in trouble because the average desk job person only takes something like thirteen hundred steps in their day. But 10,000 steps is what you need to burn enough calories to break even. And, and you know, in the United States, the everything is designed for convenience. We really don't uh, encourage you know physical activity you know, on a daily basis. Yeah, in terms of the food, my wife tells me, um, I guess now it's that if your great grandmother doesn't recognize the food, don't eat it. Yes, sir. So, what is the right amount of sugar in the bread? Hundred or hundred ten when I eat? Of what? Sugar in the bread. Oh, sugar. Well, you know the. Uh, I think the the measurement eighty to one hundred and five is probably ideal, but better yet would be a measurement of your hemoglobin A one C. That's a. Uh, it's a. It's a. Hemoglobin is a component of your body that carries the blood. How much sugar is attached to the hemoglobin? Uh, that should, uh, I'd say less than five, less than five point nine percent. So six percent and less. Yeah, that would be kind of ideal. Now in Asia, you know, we, we have a um, uh, unfortunately a, a fair genetic propensity for what we call um, uh, uh, dyslipidemic syndromes and um, so high, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high blood sugar. Uh, this syndrome is very prevalent and there's genetics to it. Now, luckily, you know, most of Asia has had very good diets in the past, but that's unfortunately changing. You know, we're, we're, in the United States, we're exporting McDonald's and we're exporting Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I think it's very dangerous. There have been a lot of studies, I've been talking to some people about the, the Honolulu Heart Study, where they studied Japanese um, uh, in Japan, same genetic background, moved to Hawaii, 
and then subsequent children in Hawaii, and the, the heart disease prevalence would go up with every generation. Same genetics, um, and then the diabetes rate and the, and the high blood pressure rate would go up too. It's a lot of the westernization of the diet. You make the time. Sure. Well, I'd say, you know, and, and I have the same problem, not enough time. Um, it's to make the time, you know, everybody has a calendar, you should just put it on your calendar, just like you would put a meeting and block off the time and, and force yourself to go. Um, but if you can't, then, then just everything you do, trying to uh, get the exercise in that you need. I, I firmly believe exercise is better than any pill that you can take. Um, but if you do the best you can with exercise and then do the best you can with your diet, uh, the, the, you know, we, we can choose what we eat. It may be a little more expensive, a little more time consuming to prepare the right foods, but we can definitely try to do that. Um, another thing is, is adequate sleep. Uh, and I'm guilty of that too, but, but you need sleep that your, your body um, you know, re responds to the, that good seven to eight hours, probably uh, at a minimum. But it, it's, I think we're recognizing a lot more you know, that, that yes, there's genetics, but we have a big hand in why we have the disease that we have. To have as many people having heart failure as we have in this country is, is just very sad. You know, a lot of it's preventable. <clears throat> Great strides in smoking in the United States. The, the rate of smoking has fallen considerably. Uh, even 10 years ago, when I first went up to my hospital, the, the unit that I was on, 80% um, of the nurses smoked, even in 1999. Uh, today, it's probably um, uh, maybe less than 5% of the nurses smoke. Right. So they, uh, the, the, there's U.S. Public Task Force guidelines and the various health communities guidelines, but you should get tested once when you get into adulthood, typically that's 25 or so. And then depending on your risk factors, um, uh, they, they have recommendations every five years, every 10 years. So if you are pretty healthy, you don't have any risk factors for heart disease, don't have a family history, pretty healthy otherwise, then the testing is pretty infrequent. And I think it, it's either five years or 10 years. If you have risk factors, family history, you also have high blood pressure, you also have something else, then the testing might be every three years. So it's kind of, as your risk is higher, the frequency of testing is more, more frequent. My doctor recommend every three months, is that too often? For cholesterol testing? And if you're... Sugar too. If you're, uh, if you're under treatment, then perhaps it would be okay to test that frequently. If you're not under treatment, it may be a little too frequent. You know, I think every case is very individualized, so you have to kind of, uh, on an individual basis, decide what's... Any test has danger. Drawing the blood, there's false positives, there's false negative. If you do 10 tests, one's gonna be a false positive or false negative, just statistically speaking. So. So we do testing judiciously. It's just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do a test. But again, if you're under treatment, we you may need tests every three to six months, depending on you know if you started off high, started off low. The questions? Yeah, in Indian country, um, Native American country, there's it's a yeah, it's just a huge epidemic. Yeah, that's going on out there, you know, and, and even genetically, right. there's a. Right. a that effect. Yeah, that's uh, it's very well known, and um, you know, and I've I've seen some research postulating that there are some genetics involved, and then the the diets have evolved, and um, and the exercise level has evolved. So, whereas probably a lot of the disease that was environmentally uh, suppressed by more healthy habits and and, and um, better diets have now evolved. Um, I, I think you know, genetics in medicine is, is a huge area and, and most academic research centers are, are pursuing genetics. We can now sequence your entire genome 
we've identified many of the genes that produce diabetes, many of the genes that produce um, high blood pressure, many of the, disease, the genes that produce heart failure. Right now we can't change any of that, we can just identify it. But I think eventually it'll be, you know, find out which genes and we may be able to alter them. But in the, in the Native American population, uh, Hispanic, Asian, there's a lot of disease that's coming forth because I, I personally, I think that we weren't designed to eat the, the amount of you know, complex carbo or uh, simple carbohydrates, the amount of fat in our diets, the number of calories that we take in. You know, no one needs a Starbucks frappuccino with 8,000 calories. Um, it's just excess calories that your body has to store and stores it in a, in a bad way. So I, I don't have the answer for the Native American population other than just like everybody else, you know, good diet, exercise. How do you educate? What's your, what's your suggestions as far as starting at that education process, especially yes. those who have no in these rural areas? Uh, it, it's it's multi, multi pronged. So in the schools, um, you have to start start in the schools, we gotta teach good habits, we gotta have good foods in the school, you know, in my kids' um, uh, cafeteria, you know, they serve fried chicken fingers and pizza. And, uh, and you know, that's just not setting up a good, healthy future life if that's what they get exposed to at school. You, you know, you do what you can at home, but, um, and you have to make it possible to get healthy foods and local growing of foods. And, and um, uh, I think the, the culture we're talking about. I'd love to bike to work, but to bike to work and then show up in my suit and have no shower and no place to park my bicycle. Uh, there's no bike paths. You know, there's no sidewalks. In my town that I live in have no sidewalk. There's a lot of so urban design. So many things that have to change in this country. Luckily, I think the rest of the world is a little better off. But I don't know. We tend to export all the bad things in the United States. So. Doctor, thank you. Ben. All right. Thank you. Thank you.